We've been talking about expectations. Can you remember what expectations means? The definition of what expectation is. Expectation is a strong belief that something will happen. Expectation is a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. Yeah, okay. A strong belief that something will happen. How many people, let's just say for just today's sake, I'm just going to use today because we can, we can tag that to really anything in our life, but how many people came to New Covenant Church today with a strong belief that something was going to happen in this house today? Amen? I can honestly say that I come into this house with a strong belief that God is going to do something not just in my life but he's going to do something in your life that's that's not some cheesy cliche cl cliche that's not something cheesy to say i'm telling you that you can come into this house and listen you can do it at your house wherever you are you can have a strong belief that god is going to do something in your life right. it can happen on the job Amen. It can happen wherever you are. It can happen driving down the highway when somebody cuts in front of you and creates an accident. You can have a strong belief that something is going to happen. Yeah, something did happen, but I'm talking about God doing something in your life through that situation. Why do I say that? Because he says that this too will work for your good and for his glory. God, that ain't fun. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to have an accident. I don't want to have to go through that. How can that possibly work for my good? How can sickness possibly work for my good? You're saying God made me get sick? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying we live in a frail body and we live in a fallen world and we are subject to the things of this world. How can that work for my good and for your glory, God? Well, I don't know. Are you seeking God in that situation? Are you seeking God in the turmoil? Or are you complaining about what you're going through? Oh, come on now. I didn't come in here to offend nobody. But you know what? That's what we do all the time, don't we? Anybody want to be honest up in here? We complain about what we're going through, don't we? We complain about our, our financial fall, or we, we complain about our sickness, or, or we complain about this, or we complain about that instead of saying, God, how can I bring you glory in this? You know what? We'd have a different outcome, wouldn't we? So we're talking about a strong belief that something will happen. Let me share this verse of Scripture with you, and then we're going to just kind of jump right into this thing. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 in the New Living Translation says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will find you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's some things that stand out in this verse of Scripture to me. First of all, God is the primary number one focus in this passage of Scripture. Is God the number one focus in your life? Now, I, I, would, I would hope that that would be the case. And I, and I pray that that is the case with every person in here today and, and every person that may be watching this on playback. I, I pray that God is the center of your life and that He is the source of your hope. So guess what? We can glean from the very first portion of this passage of Scripture that God is the source of our hope. God is the source of our hope. And listen to what he says in the, in the middle of this. Because you trust in him, yes. you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that tells me that in order for me to overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit, something has to happen. Yep. 
There is an action that is required on our part. What is that action? He says, trusting in Him. And a lot of times in life, we don't trust in God, do we? Come on now, let's really be honest about it, is we go out on a limb and we try and fix things on our own. Yeah. So today I want, to, I want to give you something today before we leave here today, and that is that I'm going to focus on trusting God. Trusting God. This this is this is so very elementary in 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 the church today, really trusting God, but so many times we are so far away from that. Trusting God. And, and so I, here's what I want to do before we talk about trusting God, I want to give you some warnings. There is a plan of action. An elaborate and a systematic plan, a strategy. There's a, there's a secret, an underhanded plan to give you false hope. Let me say that again. There's a, there's a plan of action, an elaborate and a systematic plan... Notice the word elaborate and systematic. There is an elaborate and a systematic plan. There is a strategy. There is a secret and an underhanded plan to give you false hope. And this is what the, this is what the enemy does. He wants to give you false hope. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 and 11 in the New Living Translation, we see... The apostle giving us some information here. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He's not saying in your own strength. He's saying be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Not be strong in your wisdom. Not be strong in your understanding. Not be strong in your background. Not be strong in your ability. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Listen to what he says here. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand. Somebody in this house today, someone listening on playback right now, say, I have the ability to stand. I have the ability to stand. He says, so that you will be able to stand against all of the strategies of the devil. This is the one word I want to focus in on right now, strategies. In the Greek, this word strategies is methodia. Methodia. Well, you ought to get a clue right off the first. The first syllable is meth. <laughs> Anybody that is messing with meth... Stupid. <laughs> Ignorant. Methodia. The word methodia in the Greek, it means cunning arts. It means deceit. It means trickery. It means crafty. This is the word I want you to see, schemes. The, the Greek word methodia... It means schemes. Let me tell you something. Satan is a schemer. Yes, he is. Yep. Satan is a schemer. What is a schemer? You may ask, what is a schemer? I told you, one who has a plan of action, one who has an elaborate and a systematic plan, one who has a strategy, one who is secret and underhanded to give you false hope. Satan is a schemer. That is his plan. That is what he does. And he's very good at it. He is very good at it. He has strategies in place in your life to give you false hope. So let me just give you the definition of hope. Do you know what hope is? Does, does anybody know what hope is besides your middle name, Serenity? Do you know what hope is? Hope is an optimistic state of mind. Hope is an optimistic state of mind. It is the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. That's what hope is. It is to believe. 
It is to desire. It is to place trust in. Let me tell you something. Satan doesn't want you to have hope. Nope. Satan does not want you to have hope. He wants to give you false hope. That's what he wants to do. He wants to give you false hope. And, and Paul warned us about these schemes. The Apostle Paul gave us warnings in his scriptures about these schemes of the enemy. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, stay alert. You know what? We've got a lot of Christians today that are asleep. Asleep at the wheel, so to speak. We've got Christians, we've got churches, we've got bodies of Christ all around the world that are full of groggy, sleepy Christians. Asleep. Well, that's not my job. That's the pastor's job to be alert. No, sir. No, ma'am. It is my job to be alert for me and my family. Yes, I understand I am the under shepherd and I am constantly, I am constantly fighting off wolves for you that you have no clue are trying to attack you. I am constantly at work, so to speak, fighting off the foxes that are trying to get into your hen house. Because they are crafty, they're, they're schemy, they are manipulative. And we got a lot of people today in the church that are just asleep. So the Apostle Paul gives us a warning, he says, stay alert, wake up, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. The, 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 the name here, the word devil, diabolos, it means slanderer or accusing. This is a word that I just learned today. I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> Calumniate. It means make personal attacks or false, false attacks, false statements. The enemy is constantly making false statements about you. He's constantly making accusations about you. It says that he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you know why people don't get close to a lion? Well, yeah. But you know what? They're intimidating. They're intimidating because their roar, their roar broadcast throughout the air, throughout the jungle, throughout the, the desert, wherever they are, their, their roar is dominant. Yes. And it lets everyone in the area know that if I get close to you, I'm going to devour you. Yeah. It's not the big fangs. It's, it's, it's not the, the massive mane. It's, it's none of those things. Because the only way that the lion can devour you is if you allow him to get close to you. And we've got way too many Christians that are asleep at the wheel, per se, and they are allowing the enemy to get so close to them that he is devouring you. And if you would listen for the roar, he'll let you know where he's at. He, he lets you know how close he's getting to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, For we are familiar with his evil schemes. This word scheme here is noema, and it means mind or thoughts. It means mental perception. Let me give you a definition. Mind games. Mind games. When I, when I was in the Marine Corps, when we were, when we were in boot camp, we, they, they, they tear you down physically, which is not very hard, and they tear you down mentally. And they begin to build you back up the way they want you to think. It's, it's mind games. They play mind games. I, I can remember being forced to stay awake for like three straight days. And you say, what's the purpose of that? Because when you stay awake for three straight days, you don't think straight. And so it gives them an avenue to get into your life and to begin to manipulate you mentally. 
to begin to reshape you and to reform you mentally. Let me tell you something. This is what the enemy does is he comes in and he tries to attack you and manipulate you mentally because if he can get your mind, he's got you. He's got you. So he tells us here, the apostle, he's just, he, he's like, listen, we are, we are familiar with his attacks. We are familiar with his mind games. And so he tells us in Ephesians chapter four, the, the this is, this is the reason that we are equipped by the fivefold. I, I did a teaching on the fivefold ministry here uh, a few months back or a couple of months back. And this is the reason why he's saying being equipped by the fivefold ministry, we won't, in, in Ephesians 4.14, we won't be like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Because we're alert. We're awake. We're paying attention. Let me tell you something. We have a very real enemy. We can sit there and we can say, yeah, 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 right, whatever, okay. You're getting too close to the lion, and the lion will devour you. He says when we're equipped, we won't be like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. So the enemy wants to come in and use false teachings. He wants to use mind manipulation to bring in, to bring in deception, to bring in confusion. He wants to bring in manipulation into your mind so that you have false hope. What is expectation? Do you remember what expectation is? Yes, a strong belief that something will happen. You know what a lot of people do is that they have a strong belief that they're going to fail. That's true. Why? Because they're believing the lie. They're believing the lie of the enemy because he's manipulating your mind and you have a strong belief that you're going to fail already before you ever go in a game. I talk to Serenity all the time because the team, now, now basketball season is over, but I talk, to, I talk to them all the time and they go into a game, we're going to get smashed, we're going to get killed, we're going to get cream because they're a better team. You've already been defeated in your mind. I tell her that all the time. You're defeated in your mind already. And as long as we're defeated in our mind, we're going to continue to lose. As long as we go into every situation in our life defeated in our mind, regardless if we're superior or not, we're going to lose. Because we've already made up our mind that we're losers. It's the same way in the Word. If you go into any situation in your life, whether it's in your own personal life, in your walk, in your finances, on your job, whatever it is, when you go into that situation already, well, the devil's bigger than me. The devil's stronger than me. This situation is bigger than what I can handle. Then you've already made up your mind that the enemy is going to destroy you. So I want to give you five things here today before we leave. I want to give you five reasons to trust God. Now this is not the only five. This is just five that I pulled from Scripture. Okay? Just, just to give you a good number and to give you plenty of Scripture to consume throughout the week. Five reasons that you should trust God. The first one is found in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 through 6. In the New King Jimmy, he says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Has anybody ever quoted that before? Yes, sir. Or had someone quote that to you? Why do we trust in the Lord? Why do we not lean on our under, own understanding? He says, In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your path. What does that mean? If you trust in the Lord, He'll put you on the right path. He'll give you direction in your life. 
I've heard people and I've had people tell me, I just need some direction in my life. Are you trusting the Lord? Well, I think so. Well, if you don't know so, then you're not trusting Him. Because He says, when you trust in the Lord, He will give you direction. He'll show you which road to take. He'll give you the path that you need to take. In Psalms chapter 37 in verse 3 through 5, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says, Trust in the Lord and He will help you. How many people need help? Oh, yes, sir. That's what verse 4 says. Mm -hmm. He says, He will give you your heart's desires. So often we look at this as what God can give us. Like material things. But listen, we need direction in our life. We need direction in our life. We need help in our life. And when we trust in the Lord, the Word says that He will help us. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verses 3 through 4. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 through 4. You keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. How many of us are staying focused on Christ? As in, in today's world, it's very hard. There's so many distractions in the world today. Yeah. So many distractions. I, listen, I'm guilty of it. I've shared some of my weaknesses. I'll be on my cell phone and I'll, be, I'll, I'll scroll through reels. And y'all know, for those of you that get on reels, knows that you get sucked into those reels. Because it's just video after video of stupid stuff. Yep, you're right. And then when it comes up and it's just a little preview that's in the center of your screen, it's always something that's eye-catching, you know, like granny rolling down the hill or, you know, and you're like, I have to watch that. I have to watch grandma roll down the hill. And then when you watch that one, it just sucks you into even more distractions. Next thing you know, an hour and a half has gone by and you're still sitting in the bathroom. <laughs> Oh, no. And you can't walk. <laughs> but anyway, Isaiah, tw <laughs> Isaiah 26. Is this real or what? This is real, real talk. Real talk. In, in Isaiah 26, he says, he says, you keep, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. He says, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. You know what? You need confidence. And I know a lot of people that don't have confidence. He says, when you trust in the Lord, He'll be your rock. You know what? When you're standing on a rock, you're not sinking into the mud. You're standing on something that's solid. How many, how many people have ever gone down to a river bank and, and you've stepped in that mud and the mud squishes between your toes? Yeah. But you know what? When you're standing on a rock, you're, you're not moving. You're standing on something that is solid. And that's what he says here. He says, when you trust in the Lord, He'll be your confidence. He'll, he'll be your confident standing place. He is an everlasting rock. That you can stand upon. In Psalms chapter 56, Psalms chapter 56, we see a, a continuation of this confidence. We see a continuation of, of faith and hope. When he says in Psalms 56, verse 3, he says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. 
it doesn't matter what circumstance you find yourself in. It doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in. When you trust in the Lord, He gives you the hope and the faith and the confidence that you need to go through any situation in your life, any trial in your life, any trouble in your life, any situation. Maybe it's a test. I told you all last week, I used that as an example. I was talking about tithing last week, and, I, and tithing is nothing more than a test. Are you going to trust me? And, and many people fail that test because they choose not to trust God. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, is I, I go into all sorts of situations and I say, what test? What test? What test are you talking about? What do you mean? What are you talking about? I shall not be afraid. It doesn't matter what you do, what you go into, what situation you're in. When you trust God, when you trust the Lord, He says, you shall not be afraid. The fifth one is Jeremiah chapter 17. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verses 7 and 8, he says, Blessed is the man, in the New King James, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. He is like a tree that is planted by the water, that sends out its roots by the stream, and it does not fear when the heat comes, for it leaves its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. How many people want to be fruitful? I'm not, I'm not just talking about financially. I know a lot of times that's what people think. And I know a lot of times that's what we tend to focus on. Is, is being fruitful in our family. And I do. I want to be fruitful. All right. But, but in, in any area of our life, what does that mean to be fruitful in any area of our life? What does it mean? Well, I mean, what I'm getting at is, is how do I do that? By honoring God and being close to the well. Yes. Being close to the stream, in other words. Because what he's saying there is, is no matter what comes your way, when you're tapped into the stream... Nothing will affect you. We have to be tapped into Him. So in order to be fruitful, we have to trust in the Lord. To have hope, we have to trust in the Lord. To have confidence, we have to trust in the Lord. To have the help that we need, the guidance that we need, we have to trust in the Lord. To know what path to take, to know which way to go, we have to trust in in the Lord. When we truly seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, it's not just the material things that we're going to have. It's, just, it's not just what we, what we need. He's going to give everything that we need. Listen, when we put God first, we have the understanding that we need. When we put God first, we have the wisdom that we need. When we put God first, we have the direction that we need. Do you see how we could go on and on? And I can, I can pull scriptures from the Word in every area of our life. When we put God first, we have the strength that we need. When we put God first, we have the love that we need. We want to learn to be a better husband? Put God first. When we want to be a better wife? Put God first. We want to have understanding? Put God first. have a long life, put God first. We want to know how to raise our kids, put God first. Do you see the pattern? Do you see the key? Put God first.